Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for our reading. A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. The word of the Lord. The psalm for today is Psalm 8 found in your bulletin. Let us read it responsibly by whole verse. O Lord, our governor, how exalted is your name in all the world. The mouths of infants and children, your majesty is praised above the heavens. You have set up a stronghold against your adversaries to quell the enemy and the avenger. When I 
consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in their courses. What is man that you should be mindful of him, the son of man that you should seek him out? You made him a little lower than the angels. You adorn him with glory and honor. You give him mastery over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, even the wild beasts of the field. The bird of the air, the fish of the sea, and whosoever walks in the path of the sea. O Lord, our governor, how exalted is your name in all the world. Reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject, subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with the glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now, in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. The word of the Lord.
our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Some Pharisees came, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. Then he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. You know when you go into the doctor's office and they ask you, or now you do it online, but a lot of times you go into the doctor's office and they ask you to check the forms that you filled out there or to fill out forms, um, and many official forms these days as well. They frequently ask you about your marital status. Check one, married, single, divorced, or widowed. And as a married person, I've often wondered why they ask this. Is it for who to contact in case of an emergency or co-insurance or in the case of divorce, is it because they're wondering about alimony money or, um, or your mental health, your mental well-being? And the same with widowhood. Is there something about these categories that they're trying to capture the whole of our personhood? And I, I was talking to a soon-to-be divorced friend of mine, and, and she wondered how she would respond in the future to such a form. Um, marriage, her marriage was brief and the pain, uh, painful separation, um, but necessary in their case. And, and I got curious about these forms and how people react, react to them. And looking online, there are very strong opinions about what's seen in these forms as unnecessary or even invasive as they ask these marriage-specific, demographic kinds of questions. One woman described her feelings about going into her doctor's office and she was confronted with these forms and she wasn't feeling well and she's like, yes, I failed at a long-term relationship and I have a sore throat. I am a big loser. You know, and It made my heart hurt, to be honest, even as we chuckle, maybe because we can relate, but I, it makes me approach Jesus' teaching on divorce gently, right? I mean, we hear this text and our reading from Genesis, and maybe we get a little bit nervous. There are so many layers from our culture and our religion that have been piled upon them over the centuries. Genesis teaching us about the beauty of the first humans created by God for relationship, and our minds might wander to defining marriage, the roles of women and men, who's above, who's below, and the issue of human sexuality. And, and I want to pause and acknowledge 
the pain that so many have experienced at the hands of the church as they've wondered about their own sexuality and who they are allowed to love and if God loves them. And then Jesus teaching on divorce. So many have come, come here today feeling already judged or condemned as we hear this, this story, this teaching used by the church, by well-intentioned pastors over the years in ways that have been harmful, urging couples frequently women, to stay in marriages that were physically or mentally abusive because, you know, Jesus opposes divorce, and so on. Nearly all of us have been touched by divorce. We know so many times that divorce, as painful as it is, has been an act of mercy, ending a destructive or abusive or loveless marriage. And so I want to pause for a minute and acknowledge all of these layers that we might be bringing to our Bible text this morning and take a deep breath. And for a moment, let's just clear our minds and try to look at the core of where God's spirit might be leading us, the good news that might actually be buried under all of these layers, heavy layers of culture and religion that might teach us otherwise. The Pharisees come to test Jesus. Is it lawful, they ask him. It was common for rabbis to debate these things, and, and at the time, some schools of rabbis argued that a man could divorce his wife if he found someone more attractive. Others re restricted divorce to cases of unchastity on the, on the side of the woman while others argued that a man could divorce his wife if she spoiled his food. Male-initiated divorce was the norm, and while there is some evidence that women in Jesus' time had the power to divorce, women were still more at risk of financial ruin or shame or being socially ostracized. So the Pharisees ask Jesus about it, but we get the sense that it's not an honest inquiry on a sensitive and delicate topic. They are, Mark tells us, trying to test him. Is it lawful? They want to know. And we remember that Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, was executed not too long ago for criticizing um, Herod Antipas's divorce and remarriage, and we wonder if maybe they're trying to trap Jesus in the same way. Well, Jesus, being a good rabbi, doesn't answer them directly. He points them first to Deuteronomy. And divorce is assumed. Hardness of heart, a real threat to human flourishing. And then Jesus says, let's go all the way back, all the way back to the beginning, back to Genesis, to God's dream of human partnership, intimacy, mutuality, Adam and Eve. This story of God's gift of human relationships, how we need, how we receive and honor each other as equals, as partners, not as a commodity or object or conquest, but as essential companions on this journey we call life. And in Jesus' teaching on divorce here, we hear again just how important relationships, marriage, covenant is to God. In this ideal world, in God's dream for humanity, there is no divorce. Two people come together to covenant for better or worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health. It's the hope of every couple I've married. It's the hope we bring whenever we go to a wedding. And it is the hope that I've, I've seen and experienced uh, as I've counseled couples going through difficult times in their marriage. And yet, we have our limits. We make promises, and with all good intentions, we plan to stay together forever. And sometimes, despite our best efforts, we, we cannot, in some cases we should not, keep those promises. Marriages die for any number of real and heartbreaking reasons. And this is what I want you to hear today. 
we might come to the limits of our ability to love and persevere in love with others in marriage. But God doesn't come to those same limits. The love of God does not have such limits. And don't we need to hear that good news? The love of God does not have such limits. We miss the mark on so many things. We break all kinds of promises to God and to one another. We hold on to bitterness and division. We fall and we flail and we fail in love. We are, after all, only human. But we have a God who forgives our failures, who loves us in spite of our limits to love in return. A God whose love is limitless and always faithful. Can we hear Jesus say to us this morning, as he does to the little children at the end of our story, come to me, I will let no one stop you. And then continue, I will let no divorce stop you from coming to me. I will let no disappointment or shame or failure stop you from coming to me. The kingdom belongs to you as you mourn, as you heal, as you learn. The kingdom belongs to you as you hope for new life, for new possibilities as you live into the life I am dreaming for you. Come to me as a little child, and I will bless you, and I will hold you. No matter where life has brought you this day, no matter what box you've checked, divorced, single, married, widowed, gay, straight, or seeking, that which ultimately defines each and every one of us is beloved child of God, made in God's own image. Can we hear Jesus speak to us this day and entrust the whole of our lives into his everlasting arms. May it be so. Amen. Standing as you are able, let us reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. My friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning. Good to be with you all today. Beautiful fall day. It's wonderful to be together, gather together, hold up prayers, hear our words of scripture, be fed at the table, and go out and serve in Christ's name. A couple of things to call to your attention today at noon, so just slightly after this service ends, our friend from the Fairfax County of the Aging is coming to give us a talk about dementia and how are we, how can we be a dementia-friendly people and congregation. So there's food, stay after service, and she'll be here for noon. It's a one-hour program, so we'd love to have you stay for that. Our visioning and um, dreaming work continues with Ministry Architects. If you are on the listening sessions, thank you. There are still some hard copy surveys if you have a minute to fill out today to give feedback to our facilitator. She will be here in two weeks on October 19th for a session of visioning and strategy and working together from 9 to 12 on Saturday morning. So do put it on your calendar and come. It'll be a really iterative and fun and exciting time together as we keep listening and going deeper and deeper uh, in this work that we're doing together. Uh, trail or treat is a new thing we're going to do this year instead of trunk or treat. We've got this beautiful trail behind the sanctuary. So the last Sunday of October, we'll invite our kids to wear their costumes, all of us to wear our costumes if we'd like. Some of you can sign up or just join us along the trail to pass out candy. Super fun, right? So we're going to try that. Trail or treat. And we heard about our, our Helping Hands ministry last week, and there is opportunity to share some of your gifts and talents with others in the congregation and to ask for help with something you might need. So more information about that. Um, Chuck, our faithful usher, has a few words to say as he helps us look at our ministries. I might ask you to use the microphone because it's hard to hear in the, all those of the congregation. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Those of you who are here at, say, 5 to 10, 10 to 10, there are a couple of you, uh, may notice, as I have, that Reverend Susan is often 
a little harried, a little frantic, trying to make sure there's someone to process the cross, someone to serve as an acolyte, someone to be a lector or a lay Eucharistic minister. And as I reflected on that, I realized that in days gone by, we had a system that took care of all that. But then came COVID and construction, and we began uh, putting our services together in kind of an ad hoc way, and we got good at it. But those times are past. <laughs> We're now a church. We need to behave like a church. We need to give Reverend Susan a few minutes before the service an opportunity to be quiet to think holy thoughts, prepare for the sacred service she's about to administer. So I implore all of you, think of how you might serve. Uh, as an adult acolyte, frankly, the many youth that we had that served faithfully as acolytes have moved on. They're in college, they're in other places, and some of our little ones are not quite old enough to assume that burden. So we could use some adult acolyte help. Uh, over the next few days, think about how you could serve. Contact Madeline. She will put your name in a program called Ministry Scheduler Pro and, and show you how to, to use it. You can volunteer for as many services as you like. You can, you can declare yourself not available for as many services as you like. But then we will have a base to start from. And the uh, first usher in ought to act like a coordinator and relieve Reverend Susan of those, those uh, duties so that, we, so that we act like a grown up church. <laughs> Thank you. They'll be training. You won't just be set off on your own, so don't worry. Thank you, Chuck. And one thing we, we shared last week that we're going to start this Sunday and the first Sundays of the month to follow <coughs> is after communion, after you've received communion, if you would like to receive a prayer, laying on of hands, and anointing with oil on your forehead for healing, Bishop David has graciously joined us for this ministry. And so we are going to bless some oil. It is a tradition of the church to lay hands on one another uh, and to pray for healing of body, mind, or spirit. It may be something within you. It may be something you're carrying for another person. So you're invited after you receive communion. If you'd like, come on over. He'll be right in this area, and uh, we'll have a time of extended prayer for healing. And we're going to bless our oil that we'll use for this service. <clears throat> O Lord, O Lord, Holy Father, giver of health and salvation, send your Holy Spirit to sanctify this oil, that as your holy apostles anointed many that were sick and healed them, so may those who in faith and repentance receive this holy unction be made whole. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And with all of that, let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice unto God.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with St. Peter and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing.
altar is not ours, it is the Lord's. So come to this altar, you who have much faith, and you who would like to have more. You who have been here often, and you who have not been for a long time. You who have tried to follow Jesus, and you who have failed, come. It is Christ who invites us to meet him here.
Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be quick to love and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God who loves you be upon you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Worship has ended, our service to the world begins. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Amen.